essentially it's, it's, it's Lord of the Rings is great, it was great to see The Hobbit to, and have it as a New Zealand icon. Um, I, I saw this thing on Facebook, it was a um, national emblems and um, it, it may be real. And you know, the New Zealand one was, we made Lord of the Rings here. Pretty much that summed up New Zealand and the rest of the world. Um, so it's, it's great that we've got some local talent here that we can bring to the show. Um, and as I said yesterday, um, Mark is in a play, uh, which I'm going to have to go see very soon. And remind me what the name is. When the rain stops falling. Now, that's on, it's on now. Yeah. So you can go see that as well. And ask, feel free to ask Mark about it. I'm going to put the microphone here so you can come up and ask questions. Um, but I'd like a huge round of applause. For Mr. John Callum, Mr. Mark Hadlock. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say what a treat it is to be here. Thanks for inviting us. It's absolutely gorgeous. Mark is far more entertaining than me, so he's going to uh, tell you all sorts of rude stories, and I'll be the serious one, all right? Because I do take my career seriously. Mark has always been a little bit of a joke, really, haven't you? Well, no, not really. It's just that John is my mentor, and um, everything that I've learned has just been come from John Callan. So um, I guess if you look, think about that for nearly 25 years, then, uh, well, we're both the new Abbott and Costello of the Hobbit. Yeah. Look, we could stand up here and talk for hours and hours about our experience on the Hobbit, and we probably will, but we'd rather talk about what you want to know about the Hobbit and the filming of the whole thing. So if you have any questions, just come on up and uh, I'll shove the microphone right up your face so that we can all hear what your questions are, all right? Um, the first thing, I think uh, pretty much everybody says, what was it like working with Peter Jackson? Mark, what was it like working with Peter Jackson? Extraordinary, wasn't it? It was uh, extraordinary, it really was. The man really is a genius and uh, his, uh, well, it sounds a little bit tossy, but his vision is absolutely incredible and if you can hook into what he's thinking and the way he's working, you're gonna have a good time and get a good result. I think the amazing thing about Peter is that in his head, and you know it's in his head, he's got the beginning of the film, and he's got the end of the film, and he knows exactly where he wants the film to go in the middle. It's extraordinary. He knows exactly what he wants on set. He'll come in thinking about how, when we get there, where we put us, but he knows exactly what shot he wants. He knows exactly how his film is gonna go, and I think that is the success of Peter Jackson. He has this ability um, to visualise in his own head the entire project. I don't know how anyone does that. I haven't got. I, it's impossible for me to even do a like go from A to Z in one sentence. One of the things that he uh, did was allow every one of us to make contributions to the interpretation of the characters we were doing, and uh, then when he is directing us and we're actually shooting. He will have a look at what we, the actors, are doing and will make adjustments depending on what's happening. Martin Freeman was absolutely wonderful to work with because not only was he totally dedicated to what he was doing, but he would also experiment with things as we were doing the recording and Peter would hook on to an idea and he'd say, that one you did there in take three, let's have a bit more of that. So Peter didn't just have that vision in his mind, he was allowing us, the actors, to expand on that as we were working. It was uh, very rewarding. I think probably the uh, tremendous thing to get out of us being a, a troop of dwarves, I guess, was not only did we have this fantastic hobbit called Bilbo Baggins, played by Martin Freeman, but we had this unbelievably strong, protective, um, quest-driven leader called Thorin Oakenshield, who was played by Richard Armitage. And to be honest, and I know John and I have discussed this, we would follow this man to the ends of the world. I mean, in reality, because Richard is almost, there's something about Richard that makes you want to 
would want you to follow him. And that came across so well in the film. He would, he would be quite aloof from us with his preparation for what he had to do as Thorin Oakenshield. But when we got about two thirds of the way through shooting, we understand, we understood entirely what he was about. And um, his, his drive to, 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 to the quest of this film is so clear, isn't it? And such a good actor. Um, he, he had a wonderful way of preparing. In between shots, I would go and find the nearest chair and just crash out. The costumes were very heavy. Um, Richard, I would turn around, and Richard always did the same thing. And he separated himself from everybody else, and he went down on one knee, and he held his sword, and he just leant on his sword, and he was just like this, waiting, yep. and waiting, and waiting. I actually went over to him one day and I said to him, you all right, Richard? Not really wanting to interrupt his thought processes. And he just looked at me and said, yeah, I'm fine, why? I said, oh, you just looked a bit lost and lonely over here. He said, no, no, I'm all right. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. No, you're that's not. What, that's what it was like all the yeah. time. It was great. Uh, Ian McKellen was rubbish, of course. He was complete and utter rubbish. Such a terrible actor. Oh, and he was always late, you know. Never knew his lines. Yes, the character he was playing was never bloody there, you know. He was always going off north or but south. Who was, who was he, though? He'd never done anything, never done any theatre. No, I'd never heard of him before this film. Oh, no, rubbish. No. Absolutely, you're quite right about that, Sir Ian McKellen. And all the rest of the Kate Blanchett. I mean, the ugliest woman in the world. Yes. Yeah. I was actually cast to play her love interest in the film, but for some reason I never got to actually perform it in no. the shooting. Very strange, that. No. Oh my god, if, you, if you've actually spent any time with Kate Blanchett, she is absolutely beautiful, isn't she, John? She is. Oh, I didn't notice, really. Yeah, yeah, no, she is beautiful. And she, of course, not only was uh, she uh, an extraordinary film actor, but her theatrical pedigree is enormous because she was actually, or just has just finished up being the artistic director of the Sydney Theatre Company in uh, in Sydney, in Australia, and um, so her her actual theatrical prowess is enormous. Um, she's in the Jeffrey Rush category of um, these, this amazing body of work, and that's what we found with most of the uh, Australian. Hugo Weaving was another yeah, one, gorgeous, man. wonderful, wonderful guy. Story. They can draw on this huge, huge um, body of work that they've all done in Australia and overseas. Um, and the same for, for the English actors that came to be dwarves with us. The Jimmy Nesbitts, the Ken Stotts, the, um, the, the uh, Aidan Turners, um, and of course the Graham McTavishes, who was a complete bastard, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah he's far too tall for his own good. Yes. Far too tall for his own height. Um, and um, he's big and... And he had that yeah. terrible accent. Yeah, that what Scottish he, accent. Scottish accent. Yeah. Yeah, I'm the only person in this film to have my wee... Arr, arr, arr. That's and exactly. his shoulders were so big that frequently we were actually blocked out of the shot. Just by the shot. Hey, Graham, do you mind oh, if I get in there? Fuck off. I was sitting at lunch one day talking of Scottish people and Ian McKellen was one side and then who turned up the other side? You know, it's not. No, no. Come on, comedian, he's doing a tour of New Zealand. Billy oh, Connolly comes and sits there. I have to pinch myself, I think. I'm just a jobbing old Kiwi theatre actor, bit of a director and so here I am with Sir Ian McKellen and Billy Connolly. And I said to Billy, I said, what have you been doing? He said, I've been trying on the effing armor. And I said, oh, it's really heavy, isn't it? He said, heavy. It's like wearing a Volkswagen. <laughs> it's very funny, wasn't he? And um, it's extraordinary because Billy came out to do the filming and he was supposed to be doing filming in about two weeks, wasn't he? And he ended up staying for three and a half months while he waited to get out, to get his shots done because the, the backlog of, of changes of things that had happened uh, meant that he had to come out here, so he'd come in, uh, come in for lunch every day. How's it going, Billy? Oh, I don't know. I, I've been delayed again, and then we can't film, and I don't know what's going on. I don't know if I'm going to be in the film. Um, ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> One of the things that uh, Peter Jackson did sometimes was uh, come in to shoot the scenes that were on the schedule, and we would get made up. 
and getting made up, uh, I don't know about Mark, but for me, it took between two and two and a half hours every day to get all the prosthetics and the hair and the costume, get all that together. A couple of hours, two and a half hours. And one day, we all got made up, we are all ready to go, all our stunt workers were there, all made up, all ready to go. So there's 13 of us wolves, 13 stunt workers, plus a stand-in for one of the actors who had really severe claustrophobia and asthma. We're all ready to go and we're asked, okay, just wait in your trailer. And we're waiting and we're waiting. And what had happened was Peter Jackson had gone in, had a look at the set and said, um, no, it's not quite right, is it? No. I'll tell you what, we'll do another scene. And all of us were sent home. And we all had to spend another hour getting all this stuff off. So it really took uh, the whole morning and we shot nothing. Yeah, and the interesting thing about that was that there were 13 of us and our prosthetic that we get on costs $2,000 each time we put it on. So. Wow, and how many days, John, probably all up that we didn't work? Probably about maybe 13 or 14, two weeks of um, not being utilized on the day that we were called. Not that that worried us, because we all had individual trailers with our own facilities and our own beds, our own televisions, our own sound systems. Yeah. It was really nothing that we Kiwis are used to at all. Because we used to hear all these stories about Hollywood actors throwing, my trailer's not big enough. Oh my god, my god. Our trailers, literally, if John, if you want to go to that end, um, and I'll go to this end, and I'll keep going a little bit, and that was about it, you think? Yeah, they were enormous. That, that was about the size of our trailer. We shower, bathroom, lab uh, When we first arrived on set, um, for the first day, we thought, because we hadn't been given our accommodation yet, we thought, oh my god, we're going to be living in Trader Park because, you know, there was beds and everything there. And I, we were actually quite happy about that. We thought, we oh, this is fine. In the trailer, yeah, so we're that fantastic. Yeah. We then found out we were staying in really plush apartments, which yeah. was outrageous. We had full kitchen facilities in our trailers. Never used them. Amazing. This, um, this here, in the thank you, is my face from the film. Uh, some of you may have seen this yesterday, but for those who didn't, why don't we pass it around? There you go. Don't tear it to pieces. Mark actually suggested to me that if I was ever short of lunch, I could probably stick that between two pieces of bread and chew on it. There you go. Pass it around. When John is actually still wearing his, and it's been on for a long time. That's the spare, but he's actually kept his. Some and of us yeah. had to have prosthetics. Mark didn't have any. He just went as he was. John's jealous of that, of course, and um, that's why I'm employed a lot, because I'm a cheaper version. Um, I guess one of the, the important things, there, were, there was a bit of segregation in the dwarves, um, two dwarves um, hardly had any prosthetic or anything on them, and they were Dino Gorman and Aidan Turner. We hate them. All the girls don't, because they're beautiful, and they're lovely, and they're handsome, and Actually, um, they're horrible people. They're really, very selfish. really nasty. They've um, got and disgusting personal and they've got habits. Personal habits are appalling. Oh. But also, um, Aiden actually is an international dance champion as well. Just out of interest, if you're interested, a ballroom dance champion. We Two found this out. All island ballroom, ballroom dance, dance champion. Yes. I couldn't believe it. He was amazing, and he's just so. And he paints as well. Not only does he act. He paints and dances and probably does every other bloody thing in the world. I hate multi-talented people. Dino Gorman is one of the most talented photographers you'll come across. Oh, I love him. Oh, I told him I needed some new headshots and would he mind doing them. How much was I went around to his place and he spent a couple of hours shooting things and then playing on the... Me, actually. And then playing on the computer, tweaking it and airbrushing various things as you do these days. And uh, when I said, okay, send me a bill, he said, no, no, that's on me. I hate him. Yeah. Clearly then, horrible people, the pair of them. But then the bill arrived about three months later, if you remember, correct? Yeah. Yeah, I'm still paying for that. <laughs> but did, you, did you hear about the calendar we did for Peter Jackson?
Jackson's 50th. You've heard about that. 